Hello, e Vegas. Welcome to Talking In Stations, e Vegas edition. I'm just kidding, I didn't get permission to say that. But I, I couldn't resist. I am Matterall. Uh, I created Talking In Stations podcast, uh, which airs uh, every Saturday and then is released as a podcast soon after. I uh, also happen to be a creative director for INN, that's Imperium News. Uh, before that, I was a news chief at TMC, which was Imperium News in its former name. And I was also an editor at Eve News 24. I was also a writer before that, uh, and I wrote uh, Mercenary Wars, The Brave Story, uh, Inside the Iwan Isk, uh, SMA War, and a few other articles. Um, so I was here two years ago uh, talking about searching for Illuminati, and there was something I forgot to do because I was so nervous at the beginning of the presentation. So I want to say hello to Minxi and Lady Scarlet, my two favorite CEOs. Women, women CEOs, best CEOs. So if I were to ask you how many wars have there been in EVE, uh, well, if you ask somebody who doesn't know the game, they'd probably say two or three in the last five years. Um, but it always depends on who you ask. Somebody who's a little more veteran and has played the game would say there's a few more than that. And let me ask you guys, how many wars have there been in the last five years? One. Just one. Okay. 31. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Right. So it depends on where you were, who you were fighting, and who was leading you, and stuff like that. But if you actually look at the map and how much it changes, there's a number of different wars, or conflicts, or battles. Because I'm not sure I believe in the concept of an actual war anymore. One of the things you can see by looking at this bright player map. Uh, it's actually player influence map, is uh, just how ch uh, the world changes. In 2007, there was wars and territory changing. In 2012, five years ago, there was wars and there were borders changing. And now there are wars and borders changing for different reasons. But the one thing that's consistent is the change. Uh, so that leads me to believe that wars really are just flashpoints that happen for this body of conflict that's going on underneath it. And I really like this because if you watch the whole 10 years, which you can watch now, it's like 3,600 slides, you'll see that, uh, you know, it's about a five minute video. You'll see this thing that looks like a living organism, uh, which is really incredible. It kind of reminds me of like a wave. You see this thing coming at you, but the water's just going up and down. So what's moving? What's actually moving through there? And it's an unseen force. So that's what uh, New Eden looks like to me when I see it. It's, a un, uh, it's an unseen force of conflict moving through the entire game over a period of time. And the great thing is it's all in one place and there's a history to it. So even if you make an impression on the game, your name is, it rings out kind of for eternity for all the players coming in, like who we should do. Uh, you know, Sir Mole, who is that? And so it's not just making your mark today, you can make your mark into the future. So if we think about New Eden as a soup, we're looking at bubbles that grow and pop all the time. And that's really what I call flashpoints. And that's the continuum of war. So to do this, instead of just going through a timeline and telling you all the things that happened in the last five years, which is impossible to do, uh, and again, I represent points of view of people who have talked to me, not people who haven't talked to me. So there's a lot of things that I'm going to miss, a lot of uh, branches on the tree that I'm not going to climb out to. And I apologize for that, because we're not going to really cover wormholes and all the great stuff that happens there, um, like uh, the Russians' quantum explosion taking over C7 wormholes and you know, solidifying that, uh, or low sec and all the stuff that happens in low sec constantly, faction war. We can't really cover all that, because it's hard to see, it's hard to track, unless people write it down for other people to find later. So this is really going to be about null sec. To do that, we're going to follow uh, this is the wrong slide. Well, actually, this is more unfinished business from 2015 when I was in search of the Illuminati. And I put this big old face up, and I forgot to tell you who it was. So for all those that don't know who this does anybody know who this is? <laughs> well, I don't know where you uh, dined, but if this guy was waiting on me. No, this is Itzvan Shigatsu, the leader of the Guiding Hand Social Club. 
Uh, and so finally, after two years, I finished that presentation, uh, and there it is. So he was a master of uh, uh, illusion, and he created this plot that was amazing, and it assassinated a corporate leader, and it stole all their money, and uh, he basically took the whole corporation down, and then gave the body of his victim over to uh, the people who had hired him. That was amazing in 2005 when it happened. Now it's like, oh, that's pretty cool. This time we're going to follow somebody else, someone with a lot smaller profile, somebody that you don't know. Uh, this is a character that is in my corporation. And uh, I'm just going to tell you a little bit of his story before we start, because I want to take you from the beginning of his career to the end of the career, because he passes through a lot of these flashpoints. So this is Apollo. Uh, he was a high sec dweller in Dodixie. And he wanted to PVP, so he joined a small frigate gang that was around Ranser. If anybody knows Ranser, it's a choke point for three trade hubs. So if you go through it, it's very dangerous because pirates know that too, and they stake that place out. And of course, he tried to do that and got potted. So he was outraged, and he decided he was going to get revenge. So he went through the market, and he found himself the thing that did the most damage, and that was what he was going to train. So he trained bombs, but then he couldn't, he couldn't figure out how to put the bombs on his frigate. Because he didn't understand you needed covert ops to do that. So he got outraged again, because the game was complicated. And he trained Citadel missiles. And then he realized he couldn't use those either, because he didn't have a dreadnought. <laughs> so rough beginning, but he's still eager. He's ambitious. And he answers a call to go to NullSec, because there is a collapsing alliance that will take his body and stuff it in somebody else's cannon. And so he joins. Uh, joins backwards. What did that happen? <laughs> there he is, high sec Joe. All right, so he, he ends up joining Scorched Earth, which is basically a pet, which is a derogatory name for a smaller alliance that hangs out with a bigger alliance. Uh, Scorched Earth. And there he learns uh, how to, in Scolding Pass, he learns actually how to survive in Nullsec, which isn't uh, easy to do. And uh, at that time, he's putting up towers and taking down towers, because that's what you did to control territory at the time. So it wasn't too much combat, but he heard about all the 800-man fights that were going on. They were really exciting. Um, but really, all he was doing was taking their stuff down and taking it back to safe space. So evacuations, he learned how to evacuate, which is critical for a NullSec person to learn. Then he went to Syndicate, where he bounced around and joined dead terrorists and was fighting with the locals. Uh, he learned to hunt. He learned how to hide and hunt and track people and ambush uh, and do stuff like that. Dead terrorists were a pretty good group. They were noticed by NC Dot and Evoke, and they uh, they said, "Hey, why don't you come fight with us? We're fighting Northern Coalition, the actual Northern Coalition." I'll talk about them later. Uh, and so they did a lot of raids into that territory. But then Dead Terrorists got an offer because they were doing very well to actually go south and form their own coalition with Initiative, White Noise and CO2 and take over AAA space, with the help of Pandemic Legion, of course, to take out all the big stuff. Uh, so that's what they did. It was their chance to get their name on the board, which was very important. And they went down there, and Apollo was a part of that. But it ended badly because uh, GigaX uh, got killed in a Titan, and that scared everybody. So they said, what are we doing here? We're just a low-sec corp. We're out of here. So they sold all their territory to Red Overlord and took off. But Apollo was like, I'm hooked. I'm hooked on null sec. I love this stuff. I've seen a bubble. It's amazing. Um, so I want to hang out. So he joined a new group that was just starting out at the time. And, but first I'm going to uh, take a break and talk about what Apollo could fly at the time. To get into NullSec, he was able to fly logistics, which is a very good way to get into NullSec because logistics is easier to train than, sorry, healing basically is easier to train than doing damage. Uh, it's more useful immediately and everybody will take you. It doesn't matter who you are. If you can fly logistics, you have a place with them. So. Logistics. So Apollo then ends up with Nelly Segunda, who started out uh, in Providence, kicking around, and they end up in uh, Delve at the time. There's this Thunderdome thing going on where people are just fighting the fight, nobody's taking territory, and they were just duking it out. And PL was down there with uh, Test, I think, and so you had a lot of fights going on there. Um, so there he learned how to perfect his skills in combat, how to perfect ratting, which pays the bills, let's face it. And uh, he learned how to fly carriers, which are suitcases that you can put your logistic ships into. So when your uh, alliance has to move, either evacuate or go move on a forward deployment, you take your stuff with you. And it's a, it's a handy thing to do, even if not using it for combat. 
Okay, well that's Apollo. We're gonna follow his career as we explore the next five years of war. Let's start with Tribute War, it's about 2012. First we have to talk about Nellie Segunda again. They ended up getting drafted to, uh, with Northern Coalition and Black Legion Evoke to become part of Dot Bros. And Dot Bros lived in Tribute and Vale, and they were sitting there with some moons. I'll do some backstory later to get you caught up. But this was a good fit for Apollo because he's actually worked with NC and Evoke attacking the North and skirmishes. So he didn't know who Black Legion was, but they're all right if they're all right with NC. At the same time, the cluster, uh, I can't believe I wrote it. <laughs> the clusterfuck. <laughs> All right, I did it. Oh, oh terrible. But yeah, clusterfuck coalition. <laughs> Led by Goonswarm, had some major alliances from Northern Coalition, which had fallen. So here's a little bit of backstory about them. Um, Goonswarm was the group that took down Bob pretty much, but with the help of PL and Northern Coalition, all of them were fighting Bob at the same time. And uh, right after they took, it, took him down, Goonswarm suffered their own traitor, and Cartoon basically dropped all their sov, and they ended up scattering up to Syndicate, uh, where they met, uh, where Tau Seti, an old friend of theirs from previous years, said, why don't you come sleep on our couch in Decline? So Goonswarm went up to Decline under the protection of Tau Seti, Hung out there, recuperated, had new leadership with Matani. They'd switched uh, leadership out. And then um, once they got strong, they started raising a group, uh, Test. And they were from Reddit. And Test grew up in this little pentagram in decline. It's called Testogram. Yeah, the Testogram. And so that's what's going on in 2012. If you have uh, goons who have kind of raised up Test, Test is growing so fast, it's like a giant kid that can't stop eating, and he's like huge. And uh, that's what's going on there. And what happens is the Northern Coalition, uh, some new FCs decide to attack Russians, which somebody told them that, like, don't open that door, but they did. And that Russians came into Northern Coalition and actually took them down. After so many people tried to take Northern Coalition down, Russians took them down and hard. Uh, so then they kind of scatter. Uh, and join Goon Swarm, and that's how the CFC gets really big, really strong, really stable. And this is the beginning of their stability. And I'm going to just hold my finger on that right perfectly. So the other, the other contender is Honey Badger Coalition, HBC. And HBC is Test, basically, and Pandemic Legion, uh, which is kind of funny, uh, because why wouldn't they be in CFC? I don't know. I think they wanted to have their own independence, just like they didn't want a father figure or something. So they made their own uh, coalition. But it was very friendly to CFC. In fact, you had a lot of shared resources. You had a lot of shared space. Um, people were, you know, it was, it was a very strong connection there that I think people underestimate if they look back in history. Uh, so you had HBC, CFC, kind of one big group all along the west side of the map. Uh, they even shared uh, an alliance called Executive Outcomes, if you can believe that. Because coalitions aren't in the API, they're not recognized by CCP itself. Coalitions are things that player makes. So uh, you can be in as many coalitions as you, if you want. If the coalition says you're in, you're in. In fact, who names coalitions? We don't know. But Honey Badger Coalition, CFC, together. And what they do um, is they, uh, well, first we'll talk about money, because this is really important. Uh, Oh, yeah, a little break here. We're going to talk about blockade runners. Apollo, at this point, has learned that combat isn't everything in LSEC. There's a lot of logistics involved. So he's learned to use the blockade runner to sneak pauses around, to grab some moon minerals, that kind of stuff. So NLSEC isn't just about combat. It's a huge logistical burden, and there's a lot of different ships that you should use for that sort of thing. All right, OTEC happens. And this is, again, 2012, and this is the lead up to the first war. Uh, uh, OTEC is uh, based on the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC in real life. You've heard of that, maybe, some of you. And so OTEC is the Organization for, of Technetium uh, Exporting. I don't know if it's countries or coalition, but the point is they control Technetium. Technetium is an R32 mineral, uh, which is not the rarest, but it's rare enough, and it's a bottleneck for T2 production which means that if you control it, you can control a substantial amount of income, especially if you manipulate the markets with it. It's an, you know, you can basically cartel it. Uh, so who's a part of this is uh, Goon Swarm, that represents the CFC. PL and Tess represents HBC. Evoke and NC represent Dot Bros. And those are the non-Russian alliances that are relatively big. And this creates peace. 
market manipulations, but also a blue donut. And so people started getting angry that there's nothing going on in NullSec, because uh, it's a big blue donut, et cetera. And blue donuts, so that you guys don't think I'm crazy, is blue for good standings, and round the board, round the world, makes the donut. So that's what the blue donut is. And it's economic class warfare, because the people suffering are anybody who's not in OTEC. And OTEC reminds you of that, because they put out a commercial that says, you know, only buy our stuff, it's the best stuff. Well, they're just rubbing it in your face that you don't, you're not part of this agreement. All right, the Russian alliances really are the only ones fighting at this period, and um, they're, uh, they have an interesting little history. They all go back to Curse Alliance, um, and Red Alliance broke off a of Curse Alliance, it's back in 2004. Uh, so they broke off into Red Alliance, and then from there they splintered even more. So you have Excess Death, Solar Fleet, AAA, all kind of worked together before, but they've kind of split off into their own uh, areas. So uh, UX Death, MacTap, Evil Thug, these are the notable names, the guys, the charismatic guys that took people with them when they broke off. Uh, Evil Thug is not around probably anymore, but uh, uh, MacTap was around recently and uh, UX Death is still around. So what are these guys fighting over? They're fighting over the drone regions, which is an area that nobody wants. Does anybody know why they would want the drone regions? Alloys. Alloys. Alloys? Okay, renting, right? So everybody's worried about moons and making money on moons, and there's technetium, and these guys are like, we'll rent. So that's what they're fighting over. Uh, so they're having a civil war at this time between XX Death and uh, drones, sorry, XX Death and solar, and they're supported by Red Alliance and uh, AAA. AAA usually helps solar uh, in these fights. And sometimes PL will get in there and become a, a, a hired mercenary to help one outcome or the other. They get hired by both sides and they're looking for rental income. So the tribute war happens in August 2012, roughly five years ago. And the CFC, um, well actually what happens is NC decides to break the treaty. They attack Moons and Venal, which is next door. They used to possess them, then CFC took out Northern, um, the people who took out Northern Coalition, so they possess them, and NC thinks, yeah, we kind of have a claim to those moons, so we'll attack them, we'll take them back. And there's two versions of why that happened. One is from the CFC that, um, Elo Knight, who's an FC for Black Legion, uh, he's not bound by that treaty because he's not involved in it. He's part of Dot Bros, but he's not bound by OTEC because he's not in NC or Evoke. So he can attack him at will. And so there are two CEOs for uh, Northern Coalition, a daytime or uh, European time and a US time. And one of them goes with him to attack the moons, and that's what starts the fight. Even though NC didn't mean to break it, they actually broke it accidentally because. Uh, they were together in the same fleet. But uh, after talking with NC, they said, no, we we're just tired of peace. So take what you will from that. One way or another, the treaty is broken, CFC attacks, comes down from the north, Solar decides to open up a second front from the south to help them out to support, so they're getting pinched out of the area. And that doesn't really uh, hurt them too much because Elo Knight is running Australian time zone, which is weak for them, so uh, for CFC. So he's able to do a lot of damage basically at the night time when everybody's asleep. Uh, but what does happen is NC uh, has a split, the two CEOs split, one kicks the other one out. Uh, uh, Wicked Princess gets kicked out by Vince Draken. Wicked Princess ends up going with Elo Knight to Black Legion, and Black Legion flips, starts helping Solar in the south, and uh, Dot Bros cannot resist because uh, NC, Nully, and Evoke cannot uh, take all that blob, it's huge. Um, so that's what happens there, and Evoke decides to settle out They'll buy the moons, they'll stay in the area, so NC is betrayed, so is Nully, and they go south. We'll pick up the story with them in just a second. And this is actually what, what the engine of conflict is grudges, and this starts a grudge, because now NC doesn't like CFC, doesn't like Solar, doesn't like BL, doesn't like Evoke. <coughs> so Apollo by this time is flying self bombers, or covert ops, and these are great for moving around because this is before you could fly with an interceptor, a nullified interceptor through things, right? Now you can just do space tourums and null sex, you don't stop for anything. But back then, everything, the bubble stopped everything, so you needed a cloaky ship to kind of find your way through. Uh, you can also do cloaky camping in it to kind of intimidate somebody by hanging around and stalking them, and you can do bombing if you have friends. So the rise of renting happens after OTEC. Incidentally, CCP Fozzie, uh, the first thing he did when he joined CCP was to kill OTEC. Uh, and he did that through alchemy. So 
by doing that, OTEC loses a lot of power and it starts to go down. Um, and then, you, again, grudges, right? Like who lost OTEC and who complains about CCP kind of goes together. Um, all right, so in, Nully at this point is with uh, NC Dot, and they go, they go and say, you know what, let's do our own coalition. Let's not get blobbed again. So they create N3. And N3 is Northern Coalition, Nully Segunda, and Nexus Fleet. I didn't know this, but Nexus Fleet was kind of a newbie fleet. Like, it was not anybody that was too established, but it was a place for really, really inexperienced people to kind of come in. So that, was already, that movement was already kind of starting to happen. Uh, and so it's good. Now they have a big coalition. They need to do something, so they go south. Well, there were some changes. Uh, later on, Darkness will join, which is a kind of funny thing. I'll tell you later. Uh, Cult of War and Gentlemen's Club also uh, join. That's much later on. So they go south to build their own renting empire. And they move in between Stain and uh, Drones, which basically was Solar Fleet and Stain Wagon. Uh, and they just start taking over all the territory down there. And uh, they defeat Solar in uh, Drones, and they decide to set up their own renter alliances. And so they have uh, NA, BOT, and S2N. And so these, every one of them, like NC has uh, Northern Alliance, and Nully has S2N. Uh, so everybody has their own renter alliance, and they're all making money. Now, uh, the CFC looks down on that. They're thinking, renting, that's terrible practice. That's abusive. Why would you do that? Why don't you just have teammates instead of slaves or whatever? Uh, until they figure out the PL is making $1.7 a month. And then they think, renting's not so bad. I think we'll get into that business. <laughs> so that's uh, what happens there. And a funny thing's happening at this point. Uh, you had a little, uh, you know, a group of a lot of misfits, I think, uh, is one of the ways that they might characterize themselves, at least goons might. Uh, you have Test and uh, the Bees and PL kind of on one side, but it starts to drift away. Um, and I don't know if it was public pressure or just disagreements. There's a few reasons. One is uh, possible reasons. I don't know the answer to this. Test. Um, well, there's a cultural war because uh, the Goons Forum wants to clean up their act. They want to grow up and be considered a little more professional than they've been. Uh, and Tess was not about that, so they didn't want to go into this cultural split. Uh, it was a kind of a cultural split. They didn't want to go with the like better behavior, better comms, and stuff like that. Uh, PL leadership <laughs> at this point is changing. <laughs> I don't know if that worked out, but that's what they were trying to do. <laughs> PL is, leadership is changing. Ed Shadu is very friendly with uh, Goon Swarm, and you have now Manfred Sidious, who's kind of Shadu stepping back, Manfred Sidious kind of stepping in. Manfred Sidious may have a grudge against Goon Swarm, so the attitude of PL towards goons might change. Uh, also, uh, PL tends to kind of go with a meat shield, right? So goons kind of grew up; they really don't use them as much anymore. There's this new group, new kid, Test, so they kind of hang out with Test. So they kind of uh, cultivate those relationships. That could have been it. But the tension is coming from Test, which is attacking Fatal Ascension, which is a CFC alliance. So you have HBC Alliance attacking a CFC Alliance and causing a lot of turmoil. But they technically can do that. That's totally OK. It's not part of OTEC. They're not in the same coalition. So it's OK for them to do that. Uh, and this leads to the Battle of Asakai. This is our first flashpoint. So on January 27, 2013, this is a few months after the uh, N3 forums and the Tribute War happened, uh, in Black Rise, which is low security space, you have CFC and uh, HBC going at it pretty much. And you have 2,800 pilots, which is a big deal at the time. And the reason you had 2,800 pilots um, was because of tie-dye, which we'll get to in a second. Um, this was a race to save Boat, who accidentally, he had a Titan, see? The way you use a Titan is you have a Titan, and then you teleport your fleet, and you stay there. But he did the reverse, so. <laughs> he left his fleet over here, and then he went over there. So he misclicked, and that's all it took. He jumped this Titan in, all alone, into an enemy system. And the bells went out, the bat phones rang, and everybody said, hey, let's get to this fight. He's done it. He's like made himself vulnerable. So everybody starts running to this fight. Uh, and his guys are like, oh my god, we've got to save him, so let's go. So everybody's running to this point in low sec, and uh, tie-dye is starting to cramp the time. It decouples time from virtual time to reality. So you have time to call your friend and say, get on the computer, get in the game, and get over there. And tie-dye doesn't affect wherever you are, it affects where the battle is. So the battle moves slower and waits for you as you get there. 
And that was a big problem. Uh, that it, but that's what allowed it to get to 2,800, because now everybody could get there. It was low sec, so you weren't bubbled and camped out. So pedestrians could go in there and check it out. Uh, so there's a lot of tourism. <laughs> fight, fight tourism. <laughs> Yeah, so Tide is good. It stops the server from just out and out crashing. But taking away that risk and slowing it down creates other problems, which is capital projection, which uh, becomes a problem later on. So Asakai, the winners and losers, of course, the CFC lost a bunch, mostly dreads. Um, and that was about 600 billion. And that's not that much by normal standards. Back then, it was a bit more, because it's harder to make that kind of money. Uh, but at the same time, uh, an organization like CFC won't have cash. They invest that money into markets. So in order to get $600 billion to replace what was lost, they would have to liquidate positions in the market that they may not want to liquidate at that time. They might be waiting for something to kick in to make more money, so they have to do that. So Boat gets chastised, and they take away his capital keys. Um, yeah. But the interesting thing here is the headlines that go out to all the people may bring a bunch of recruits. And most of those recruits are going right into red. And the reason that happens is because there's a Reddit thread uh, in our gaming, and it talks about this huge battle because of the big numbers, and uh, it gets like 3,600 upvotes. And, uh, you know, this, so there's all these people who play games are seeing it in front of them in Reddit, and they're also seeing that there's a Reddit corporation in the game, and they can just go right in and join. And so it's like feeds right into Reddit, so you get the swell of new players coming to EVE, going into Reddit, and the alternative which is Brave, which just starts growing because it's a concept at this point, but it grows really fast, and you'll see a lot more of it later. And you can see as sales go through CCP and stuff like that to attract those players and the publicity is out there, you can see that was a really good month for a lot of new people starting out. This 2013 it was a huge population uh, at the time, too. Uh, okay, so PL decides that they're not really want to be part of this coalition. They want more targets to shoot, not more friends, so they kind of bail out of that, but they do a funny thing. They leave a guy behind, Sork Dragon, to run the coalition. So he has a small alliance because he broke off PL. And he's representing thousands of players in test. It's not his alliance. Uh, so what happens famously is that Sork Dragon uh, meets a guy named Pro God Legend, who's from Nully Segunda. And uh, they have a few words at FanFest. Nothing like that ever happens. And on camera, uh, because there's some uh, grudges, again, grudges, Sword Dragon says, HBC is going to war. This is like a live, right? Uh, and it's going to be Nully. I think he even pointed, but if he didn't, he should have. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be Nully there. We're going to crush them. And uh, Test is like, who are you? I'm not going to follow you. Uh, so they decide to basically break up, and that leaves Test all alone. So Test is alone. CFC is kind of angry at him, but you know, whatever. It's a little kid that was rebelling towards you. Um, but uh, at that point, there's all these new people coming in, and so everybody wants a part of that. So Test, no, sorry, uh, Goons and PL and NC get together and run these fleets because the FCs know each other. So it, they're all friendly to each other. And there's no political, there's no sovereignty at stake. They just want to have some fun. So they're beating up on Test, and Test starts growing angry, and their numbers swell because they're having a good time too. And they get up to like 1,200 in a fleet. Uh, and so and three, uh, Nelly Zagunda is thinking, wow, 1,200 in a fleet from one alliance. We could take goons with that. Those are huge numbers. So um, we'll come back to what happens next. But first, I want to take a little commercial break about Lokis. Uh, if you uh, need to be in a fleet and not get killed right away, a T3 is a good way to go. It has a really tough tank. It also can uh, move fast and project a lot of damage, but it takes a lot to get into it. But by this time, Apollo is totally mastering Loki. Right before Fountain War, because Fountain War is where uh, Loki started being used. So July 28th, which if you think about it, is only six months after Asakai. So you have six months of recruiting and stuff. Uh, in CFC and Test and N3 go to war together over Fountain. Now it turns out. I've heard that uh, CFC offered Test a chance to get some moons down in Aquarius to take out Raiden, an enemy of theirs, and collect those moons. Test said, no, we really don't want anything to do with you. So the CFC decided, well, we'll just attack you instead. And so they took over their stuff. And so that's what that attack came from. And basically, the war went really well for Test and N3 at the beginning, but then things start to fall apart for various reasons. One is that CFC was 
caught off guard with too, stuff that was too expensive, and they were fighting a war of attrition. So they needed to be able to die over and over and over again, and you can't do that with limited supply ships like a TFI, a Tempest Fleet issue, right? Because there's only a certain amount of EPOs to be had. But if you can build a Baltec Megatron, uh, and you have the BPOs, there's no limit to how many of those you can make. That's how you fight a war of attrition. And so that's what they did. They had to switch that way. They learned some hard lessons. At this point, Boat still F seeing, but uh, he has a bad time of it. So they take away his keys to subcapitals. So now he can't fly capitals and he can't fly subcapitals. So he flies bombers. All right. And he does it to great effect, except sometimes he's killing his own guys doing it. But they're screaming, You're killing us. It's okay, I'm killing the enemy too. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so CFC and Fades Fountain. And uh, then, oddly enough, PL says, yeah, we don't want anything to do with this. We're going to go do something else. We have a tournament we want to play. Uh, Solar rises up, because NC and N N3, basically, are busy. So Solar rises up and starts taking territory. And so NC says, we got to go deal you know, with the gimp in the basement. So they go back. <laughs> to take on solar and start beating them back. And Nully's like looking around thinking, well, it's just us and Test, and Test doesn't have any FCs because they all went to PL. They like the way PL looked. And they don't really have any leadership because they've gone through four or five different people. And Sort Dragon, who's really mad, says, here, Goonswarm, you can have five uh, systems or a constellation up in the north, so just flip it over to yourselves. And it was his goodbye present to Test as he went down south to form darkness and work with Russians. Um, so it starts going really badly for Test. Well, by this point, uh, Pro God Legend is actually joining Test and flying their ship, flying their fleets for them. Um, and uh, a great FC by the name of Dark Razor is flying the nighttime capital stuff for NC. One of my favorite FCs. Dark Razor, for those that don't know, uh, is uh, Larrikin, CCP Larrikin. Good FC. Well, anyway, the, uh, uh, one of the doctrines that was used was Slow Cats. Uh, and we can talk about them a little bit later because they're used over and over throughout this period and they're very deadly and un you really can't match them. You can only make them painful uh, by slowing them down. Uh, but what happens is that once the time zone for test is defeated, there's really no way uh, they can win this war. So they say, let's have one last fight in 6VDT. So everybody shows up for this fight and there's over 1,000 people uh, from test. There's over 4,000 in system. Uh, obviously, they all get slaughtered, and it's great fun for all these guys. And Nelly Segun is scratching their head thinking, where were you guys when we were fighting this war? The fleet's gotten down to 200 when we were fighting the war, and now there's like a 1,000 of you all of a sudden. But if you think about it, a lot of the people that had come in and tested this time came after Asakai and really just wanted to have some fun, and losing was no fun, but this big party of a big bash was going to be okay. So that totally makes sense to me. But uh, yeah, so what happens now is that Basically, a CFC defeats HB, uh, Test and pushes it into Delve, and then from Delve, they get knocked out into Faction War, and they're out of the picture for a while. They got down to like 50 people in a fleet, so they're essentially dead uh, at the time. And that was the fall. At the same time, NC says, well, we got to go back and fight Solar because they're coming back, so let's go finish off Russians again. So they go back, and they start beating on uh, Solar and pushing them out in, of the drone regions, and that's where a lot of fighting happens with PL, NC, and Nulli Segunda until they dead zone um, Solar at uh, Outer Pass in R3PO. Uh, and a dead zone basically is they, they lock, a, lock a station up, clear all the rights, and give the key to only one person so there cannot be a betrayal, and it's the most trusted person, and that way the only way that things get out in or out is through that one person, and that person holds the key and swallows it, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, but this is actually the beginning of the Halloween War. Um, oh, by the way, N3 and PL, they didn't just defeat Solar, but they took over their territory, so now their renter, is, renter empire is totally expanding to make all that money. Um, but yeah, the, uh, the Halloween War is actually on, on the way uh, after Halloween, and uh, that's what that fight is, it's N3 and Solar. Uh, the CFC has just defeated uh, HB, uh, Test in, te uh, in Fountain, and they're coming down and saying, well, let's participate. We'll third party in this war and get some kills. So they've been fighting for a few months now, and they end up in the area with their super capital fleet. So you have super capital fleets from all the big alliances within jump range of one area, and that is Immensia. Uh, well, 
Apollo at this point, uh, he's really liked Pro God Legend as an FC, but he really liked Dark Razor, so uh, Dark Razor was some NC. So he decides it's time to graduate to NC, and he's going to move to NC because he can use the Dreadnought. And Dreadnoughts are great for taking down pauses and destroying bigger ships. And so in order to like use these all the time, you really need to join groups that use them all the time and that sort of thing. Uh, but these great ships, if you can get into one, they're a lot of fun. Uh, so yeah. So there he is. He's moving on to Northern Coalition, which is a top tier alliance. Um, and it, they use heavies and supers all the time. But before he does that, he decides he's going to take all his stuff and just put it in one place so he can sort it out, get rid of some stuff, and move into NC totally clean. So he takes all his stuff and says, you know what, I'm going to take a break, too, for about a week. Uh, and he moves and decides he's going to be relaxing. So he becomes, he's tired of war, wants to be a moisture farmer for a while. And uh, he collects all his stuff in this really backwater mining place that nobody can get to because it's at the end of this long thing. It's always bubbled, uh, so, and it's you know, sino jammed, so it's totally safe. So that's where he's at. Uh, he's relaxing, he's got all his stuff in the station. And that system, which is really cool, was BTAC R5RB. <laughs> So yeah, he was totally safe until he wasn't. <laughs> Halloween War doesn't end, but there's a huge battle that happens in BTAC R5RB. That happens one year exactly from the Battle of Asakai on the very same day the next year. So you can see how compacted these are. And this is N3PL versus Russians with the support of CFC, who aren't really third partying. They're actually helping uh, Russians. Because remember, Solar worked with CFC to attack NC in the north. Uh, so what happens here is, um, I think this is really well documented, so I won't spend much time on this, but uh, you have a giant fight that has 7,500 people in the area, because not everybody was in uh, BTAC-R itself. Some people, a lot of CFC subcaps were actually guarding the bases of NC and uh, Nully, making sure that they could not get any support in there to clear tackle to get people out. So it was a very good plan. Uh, the way that this all came down is, uh, Basically, SOV wasn't checked off, or there was a bug in the system, depends on who you ask. Downtime comes, which is, you know, downtime. And then the, once downtime passes, sovereignty drops. So there's this drop in sovereignty, which was alarming. And the uh, PL troops have kind of gone up north to deal with some SOV issues. So they scramble back, and they're now jumped into uh, BR, kind of uh, fixed the situation, and everything's fine, but they have to wait for this thing to online. So they're sitting there waiting. And after downtime, after Australian time, after downtime comes Russian time. And the Russians see that and say, we could take that. And so they call the CFC, and they jump in, and uh, five alarms go off, and you have everybody jumping into this. All these fleets were in the proximity, and so they all jump into this huge fight, which takes an entire day. Uh, and it ends up that uh, the CFC wins that fight. And I want to step back and say a few days before that fight actually happened was another fight that was really big in Head GP, where the same forces were assembled. And uh, what happens is the systems crashed, so CFC didn't fully commit, so it didn't happen in Head GP, but it would have. Uh, Vili was sitting there waiting with super capitals to give the signal to jump in. That signal never came because their guys were reporting they couldn't see anything. In the meantime, they were being decimated by uh, N3. And they lost like 300, 400 uh, dreadnoughts. Also, a very funny thing about Titans. Titans can only jump as far as their light year range allows them to do. And uh, going back to BTAC R, um, and so you can't jump past your light range. You also can't jump in the same system. So if you're in that system, you can't jump into the system. And BTAC R turned out to be where all the Titans were for an, uh, PL. And so they, could, they had to jump out of the system to jump back into the system, which delayed their arrival. And this was a race to destroy Titans, because it really was a, a Titan on Titan fight with Doomsdays, uh, not really anybody else uh, being considered. So that's why it got so lopsided so fast, and it kept going in that direction. That was BTAC R. But that didn't end the war. The Halloween, keeps, Halloween War keeps going. The CFC uh, uh, decides to spare um, PL, and, and they sign a deal called the uh, Bot Lord, which is uh, Brothers of Tangra Lord which is landlord, so that's how that income is together. And that just means that we won't attack renter, we won't attack each other's rental income, so you're cool, we'll let you rebuild. 
Uh, Matani says that might have been one of his bigger mistakes, but as, as it turns out later on. Uh, CFC is tired. They want to go home, but there's uh, a plea from Matani who just wants seven more days of commitment to dead zone Nelly Segunda into, uh, <laughs> into a station in Detroit. Now, Nelly Segunda was like, why are you attacking us? We're under, we're under the protection of Bot Lord. <laughs> uh, I don't know why they thought that, but uh, they got fooled. And it didn't, didn't actually kill them, uh, but, they, uh, but they were kind of surprised by it, which is funny. Uh, OK, so the Halloween War keeps going on. And uh, mysteriously, darkness of despair disbands. And all of a sudden, N3 sees an opportunity and grabs all their sovereignty. And that opens up a rip in this fabric that just unrolls. And so you have. Uh, now that CFC has gone back to rest, and uh, you have uh, Russians not able to contain N3 and PL, and they take over the entire area. And while they're doing that, uh, Apollo is, uh, uh, he told me that he's in Esoteria, blasting uh, a lot of towers in his new dreadnought and stuff like that. So that's the kind of work that was done. It was really just late night banging on you know, system after system after system. Sovereignty is a lot of work. For those who haven't uh, done it, it takes a long time. It takes a lot of commitment from a lot of people, especially uh, FCs like Minas 93, who was leading NC forces at the time there. So uh, yeah, so NC cleans up the South. And they say, yeah, we have a lot of room now. Why don't we make some room for these new guys called Hero Coalition? That's Brave. It's now grown big. And Test, which is still not recovered, but on their way, uh, and a couple other alliances. And so they make this space for um, them in catch. And they decide that, uh, there they are, Hero Coalition. So Hero Coalition kind of escorted in by N3 and allowed to live there. And PL decides they're just kind of, they're just kind of banging with a stick. So PL is beating up on Brave uh, most of that. In the meantime, the Imperium is going through a rebrand. And so they have their uh, alliance called. The CFC is gone. You have the Imperium now. And that's I say it. And it could be that it was easier for newspapers to report on, because uh, they can't do what I did. Uh, so they would say the cluster and stuff instead of that. So they said, let's just change our name to the Imperium. And you know, uh, that's what happened there. And so you have changes. Uh, Fatal Ascension actually diminishes and goes away. Uh, Circle of Two, FCON, and o, uh, EXE go away eventually at different times. And Snuffbox gets added. And that's how that coalition has changed over time. No false moves. And this is where we enter kind of a wait and see approach. So the wars kind of die down for aggressive acquisition of territory because the mechanics are changing dramatically. Do you remember that carriers in tie-dye could make it to just about any fight? That's very dangerous because now you could have cataclysmic fights all the time, and that would destabilize the game. Uh, BTEC R was an example of that. Uh, so the mechanics have to change. They have to curb force projection, and that's when jump fatigue comes in and says you can only go so far so fast before the rubber band effect of stretching you to have to wait a long time happens. You also have solve changes that are happening. Um, and uh, that's called Aegis solve. And you have, um, uh, you have a response to that from the alliances of limited engagement. So you have a lot of kind of horsing around. N3 and PL, BL that is, attack Fountain a few times, just having incursions in the Fountain. Uh, the CFC decides to blitz Providence. These are not aggressive takeovers. These are more, uh, let's see, let's, let's test this stuff out, which is what the mode they're in for for about a year. Uh, and you have PL hitting Brave saying, join us, join us, join us. And Brave's like, we don't want to be political. Uh, but uh, uh, like, test has now gone away. PL needs another big group to kind of like help them out, you know, to be either killed or to help them get loose. I don't know what, even though they have their own groups. Um, to do that. So that's what's going on there. The trends at this time are the weaponizing of newbies, which was kind of a first. Because if you put them in the right ships and you, and you tell them what button to push, they can be effective in large numbers. Uh, and that is a lot of E-War and smaller cruisers and stuff like that. So brave newbies kind of pioneered that. They really catered to brand new guys. Uh, and that was their whole thing. Just have fun. Just get blown up. It's great. So uh, Brave kind of dissolves after the Hero Coalition gets uh, disbanded by a coup and then counter coup and just bad leadership at the time, frustrations all around. And so PL makes their own uh, group ver version of this called Horde. That's where Horde comes from. It's the modeled after Brave. Brave wouldn't join PL, so they took some FCs from Brave and created Horde. Easy enough. 
Karma Fleet does the same thing. They take the spy master from Brave. They didn't have a spy master. He was very limited. He couldn't actually do the spy master stuff because they didn't want to get involved with things. So they said, you want to do the spy master stuff? Come work with us. We're goons. We do that kind of thing. So you have uh, that uh, group going to them. And that is the beginning of Karma Fleet. So you have these two groups almost at the exact same time forming up based on uh, the newbie uh, model. And you have Northern Army, which is actually put together by Northern Coalition, but that one doesn't last as long. At the same time, another trend is casinos. Casinos have always been around, and gambling has kind of always been around EVE. It's kind of the adult thing to do. Uh, but casinos kind of change. Summer Blink uh, goes down through a scandal, and all these uh, fans of Summer Blink end up looking around for the next thing, and that was I Want Isk. Uh, but what they were doing was making a lot of money on boredom, on, on people who were just kind of waiting around for things. And we're in a period of rather stagnation, no big themes going on. There's a lot of activity, but there's not like, you know, there's a lot of time, a lot of downtime. There always is with Eve. So they're making a lot of money. Uh, but I want Isk decides they're going to politicize their money and use the money to hire mercenaries to attack their enemy, uh, the enemy they see fit. So that's a dangerous trend. Because that, that is unassailable wealth. You can't destroy it. You can't beat it back. You can only deprive it of having wealth. And the more you talk about it, the more wealth it gets because it's publicity for their website. This is all offline. You can't touch it, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the reasons uh, the casinos were deadly. But this sets up the casino, I want ISK versus Imperium War. Because those, those are actually, uh, those, casi those um, uh, mercenaries are hired. Let me actually take, this, take you through this. So SMA, which is uh, the Space Monkeys Alliance, Hell purchased some, uh, a corporation in that alliance, Hell purchased some uh, guys that turn out to be bankers for Iwanisk. And they take all their money in the process, because why not? Ha, huh, that's what we do. Well, it turns out Iwanisk says, hey, my bankers need the money, because they're the guys that front the money to my customers. Give them back their money. <clears throat> well, negotiations break down. Uh, there's a famous line of, uh, have you? <laughs> I want to ask, ask the diplomat, who's not really a diplomat, have you asked your boss if you know, he'll reimburse? And uh, he says, well, my boss says eat a bag of dicks. I think that means hello in Eve, but I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, he says, well, I'm going to hire mercenaries, and I'm going to kill you. And they say, we're SMA. You can't kill us. We're like a NullSec alliance. <laughs> they really did. Uh, <laughs> So SMA says, oh yeah, watch what we can do. So they attack their server, and they make themselves a bunch of money, ISK, and they actually uh, expose a scandal that there's RMT involved, which is hard to prove. Uh, and so uh, with that move, um, the uh, I want ISK owner says, yeah, I'm hiring mercenaries for sure now. So he hires mercenaries, and that ends up bringing all these people to a fight. SMA is tied to the Imperium. The Imperium is loyal to their, to their group, so they have to back up what SMA does, even if SMA is doing it without their permission. And this is what draws them into this war that nobody really wanted. There are other factors as well. LOSEC is really mad because they were told they were going to have to pay for their property in LOSEC, uh, which never actually was a program called the Viceroy program. It wasn't real, but it was an announcement that there might be a Viceroy program. So that illusion alone is enough to get people to work together that normally don't, like Shadow Cartel and Snuff. They hate each other, but then they're subjugated, and they get, they get mad and unionized and go fight CFC or the Imperium. Oops. The Imperium was actually a little bit weak because Razor seemed to be diminished in numbers. Uh, SMA has been beleaguered by countless people just ripping at their uh, income sources. Uh, and there's a lot of public anger due to this thing called a Kickstarter. Uh, so people are kind of upset about that, about the Fountain War. They wanted to talk about it. Uh, but also some of the behavior coming out of TMC at the time, writing of articles, it kind of made people a little bit angry. Uh, so this new coalition forms. And it is the Money Badger Coalition. And you can probably see that it's based off the Honey Badger Coalition, but it's money involved. And that's basically um, N3, uh, PL, uh, it's basically the old HBC, and Voltron. Uh, Voltron is the low set groups that didn't work together that did for that. And this is called the Casino War, or World War B, or Easter War, or what did Matani call it? War of Solveless Aggression, which is like 
Gone with the Wind style, uh, you know, it's a take on War of Northern Aggression for the American, uh, uh, for non-American audiences. That was the, the uh, Civil War of America. So interesting, because he was trying to make the point that there was no uh, Sov. Uh, these people didn't have Sov, uh, and they were still able to do that. OK, so MPC invades the North. Uh, huge fights happen. CO2 decides they're going to flip. FCON flees. Razor can't be found. Uh, <laughs> Structures come in, and there's a funny thing about structures. If you put a keep star down and put 1,000 pilots into the area, time slows down enough that you can't possibly take down a keep star with that writing on the wall. It was kind of a bug. Uh, CFC decides they can't possibly claw their way back in. So they take off, and they go down to Delph. And Apollo is a, a, like, having, a <laughs> having a great time, because he's, he's won this war. Uh, at the same time, he's kind of shocked. Uh, so that was his reaction. Well, the New World Order is formed, and you have Imperium and Delve uh, recuperating. The casinos are banned for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, NPC, just, you know, had a purpose, did its purpose, and now is starting to break up. Snuff kills Shadow Cartel on their way home. <laughs> the world is right again. Uh, NCPL and Horde now, they uh, attack CS, uh, and CO2 and test, I should call it CS, and um, they end up knocking them out of the north and creating a huge fight, which is the biggest fight with uh, troops in one system. Uh, that was MTAC O, and they destroy the Keepstar there. That was fully operational, one first one of that type destroyed. Uh, and so the refugees, we call them, end up in uh, the south, where they recuperate tests, CO2, FCON. They're all in the south together. Uh, and that leads us to the current era, which is that NC and PL are, continue to work together with Horde. Imperium has grown much stronger financially and therefore militarily in the south uh, with Delve. They've uh, expanded to the tri-regional area, as we know of period basis in Aquarius, but they're also expanding to Fountain uh, through some negotiations or something. So they're still growing and doing well. Militarily, they haven't really won any big victories yet, except that they're, and I'll get to that in a second, the diplomatic missteps are going on with the groups that have landed, the Legacy Coalition, Vanguard Coalition. These are the groups that I was just talking about that fled. Uh, Triumvirate joins them. So Triumvirate tests CO2. These groups are all in the south, uh, finding space for themselves. Brave is back in the same area they were before. Uh, and the diplomatically, things are getting tangled up. And I won't go too far into that. Uh, initiative and Snuff start working together. Snuff actually joins the Imperium officially. Uh, and CO2 is disbanded basically killed off by their own guy, the judge, who's here, if you want to say hello. Uh, the judge steals a wallet, and he uh, takes all their ships, takes the Keepstar and gives it over to Goon Swarm and the uh, Imperium, their enemy. The next era that you're going to see in war is moon mining. It's going to be a remap. There's going to be a lot of stuff going on for that. Station conversion, uh, faction stations, and Providence, look out, they have a lot of stations there. So. Apollo, hero, farmer. Uh, what's going on with him these days throughout this entire thing? He is now flying Titans for Dice Corporation. That's destructive influence in Northern Coalition. Of course, this is a main, and mains don't fly Titans. Their alts do. And so Apollo's alt is Matterall. Thank you very much.